Okay, so we are in uh, our Torah portion in the Midbar is <clears throat> Baha Alataha, which means when you ascend. And it's talking about um, lighting the menorah. And we start in chapter 8, verse 1. We go through part of chapter 12 uh, up to verse uh, 16. Actually, it's all through 16 verses in, uh, in uh, chapter 12. So 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, so there's, you know, a, a bunch of different things in here. Um, we're going to talk about the menorah today. Um, but uh, we also, in chapter 8, talks about consecrating the Levites for service. And so we've done a teaching on that, kind of uh, uh, likening that to you know, how uh, our walk, you know, our, our preparation for service uh, in, uh, in Yahweh's service. We see in chapter 8 that uh, Levites begin learning the process, begin learning and training at age 25, and at age 30 is when they actually begin their work in the, uh, the tabernacle, in the temple, in, uh, in service. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that Yahshua began his ministry at age 30. Um, so chapter 9 talks about the second Passover. The second Passover is always kept on uh, the 14th day of the second month. And it's, you know, the only observance that we're given. It's so important that we're given another chance. And there's some reason that we're not able to keep the Passover like we're really sick or, you know, we have to be away for something and we just cannot, it's not possible for us to keep the Passover gathered together with the, the, uh, how we normally do it. We do get a second opportunity in, uh, in the second month to keep the Passover. So that's how important uh, that is, that Yahweh really, uh, really wants us to keep the Passover. Once, so there should be no reason you know, 95% of the people are going to do it on the first month, on the 14th day. The 5% or so that are just simply not able to um, are, have an opportunity to do that on the second Passover. <clears throat> then we talk about uh, the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night and how Yahweh led his people through the, the wilderness. We did a teaching on that about... Um, the following the pillar of cloud and fire. Um, that's uh, a teaching you can take a look at if you want to. Uh, chapter 10 talks about uh, the communication for uh, moving Israel. It's done with trumpets, uh, the silver trumpets, the two silver trumpets, and uh, when those things were, were used to uh, <coughs> communicate with uh, the, the nation. So uh, in chapter 10, uh, verse 11, then we see where now Israel leaves Sinai and uh, where they camp for a year and a little more, three months or so, a year and three months, uh, and how they're breaking camp and moving and all that process there. Uh, <clears throat> in chapter 10 and verse 29, uh, Moshe uh, invites his uh, uh, his father-in-law uh, to stay with him and stay with Israel and, and join them. He decides not to. He goes back to Midian. Uh, <clears throat> Israel's uh, journey then begins at the ark leading the way. And then in chapter 11, we see more complaining, more people that are unhappy with how things are going um, with the manna. And Moshe has um, 
a lot of uh, he's getting worn out at this point and it even hasn't been all that long you know it's been a little bit more than than a year uh, <clears throat> you see most of the people also that are are complaining here in chapter 11 verse 4 he says the mixed multitude were in the midst lusted greatly so the children of Israel also wept again and said who is giving us meat to eat and again we've talked about this before the mixed multitude sort of the outside of the camp the outskirts of the camp not you know the the, uh, the people that are really on board but there's that mixed multitude on the outside that they're kind of pulling people away with their complaining with their um, with the um, <clears throat> attitudes that they had that are just affecting uh, affecting the the uh, the believers and we have that happen now we have people that are you know sort of in sort of out you know they just are never happy with what's going on they always want things you know to be done their way and you know they're just are not people that want to get on board um, so we see that uh, that happening in ancient Israel um, here we uh, <coughs> we see uh, uh, Moshe's despair um, in verse 10 he says and Moshe heard the people weeping throughout their clans and each man at the door of his tent and displeasure of Yahweh burned exceedingly we've kind of done some teachings on this about this complaining this dissatisfaction this unhappiness with the way Yahweh operates in our lives and that really uh, is something that separates us from Yahweh and we see that here in uh, <clears throat> in verse uh, the verse in verse 10 and the displeasure of Yahweh burned exceedingly and in the eyes of Moshe it was evil so Moshe said to Yahweh why have you done evil to your servant and why have I not found favor in your eyes to put the burden of all these people on me was it I who conceived all these people was it I who brought them forth that you should say to me carry them on your bosom as a foster father carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their their fathers where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep before me. Give us meat. I'm unable to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. So even Moshe was getting worn out by all of this. <clears throat> so what did uh, so Yahweh then in verse 16 he he uh, he instructs Moshe to pick 70 men uh, 70 men are, are appointed as elders uh, 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 of Israel and he says pick these people whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of appointment and let them stand there with you so Yahweh um, <clears throat> actually separates these men and uh, And he says in verse 17, come down and I shall come down and speak with you there and shall take of the spirit that is on you and put on them. So he, he very few people have Yahweh's Holy Spirit at this point. Moshe, Aharon, you know, uh, have it. But uh, now he's also providing Yahweh's spirit to um, these 70 men to help Moshe with administering the nation. Um, and we see here in uh, verse uh, 24 Moshe went out and spoke to the people the words of Yahweh and he gathered the 70 men of the ch elders of the people and placed them around the tent and Yahweh came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders and it came to be when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied but did not continue so we had um, these men given power by Yahweh to help Moshe continue to uh, 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 serve the people of, of Israel. And chapter 12, then we talk about uh, Miriam and uh, Aharon, who um, speak against, they have a problem with Moshe, basically they 
have a problem with his second wife, um, the, the Cushite woman. We don't know her name. Uh, we aren't given her name, but she's a Cushite. Um, so Miriam and, and Aharon have a problem with that. And, you know, they're basically kind of running their mouths about this. Uh, and, uh, and Yahweh does not take kindly to this. He calls Moshe and Aharon before him at the, uh, the tent of appointment. And uh, Moshe, uh, Yahweh comes down and he strikes uh, Miriam with uh, leprosy or sa'arat, right? Which that skin disorder basically, you know, makes the skin sort of decompose on on you, on you, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, so Aharon goes to Moshe and says, you know, don't hold this sin against uh, Miriam. She's uh, she sees that, uh, you know, that uh, she's sinned greatly against him and, and, uh, and uh, Miriam does, is healed after, uh, after seven days. So uh, that's uh, kind of the summary of our portion for today. We're going to talk today about um, the first part of the portion, which is uh, when you ascend. Um, name of the portion, which is Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, speak to Aharon, say to him, when you ascend. So these, these, uh, these lampstands were not at, you know, were not small. And if you remember in, in Israel, we saw outside the, uh, that synagogue, there, that big menorah, you know, under glass. Remember that? Yeah, so that's sort of what they think was life size. So that was bigger than, you know, a person. Um, so he had to kind of get up on something to be able to trim these lamps, to be able to, to light them and keep them, keep them burning all the time. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, the menorah today. You know, uh, we've done teachings, I think, about every bit of furniture inside of the tabernacle. We've done the altar of incense. We've done the showbread. Um, we've done the brazen uh, lavers. We've done the, the altar. But we have not done the uh, menorah. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the menorah. So we all know what a menorah looks like. You know, we have all seen them. It's described in, uh, in Exodus chapter 25. Uh, 31 to 40, and again in 37, 17 to 24. It just gives us a very detailed description of what a menorah looks like. It has a single, it's made out of one solid piece of gold, right? And if, if you ever get a chance to in, be in Jerusalem, you can stand next to the one that, that uh, the Temple Institute made. It's pretty big. Um, so that would have been a pretty big chunk of gold that that thing was made out of. And it has one single, uh, you know, center branch. And then from that, six branches out. So there's a total of seven. So that's, it's different than what, you know, we see for a Hanukkah menorah that has nine branches. That's not described anywhere in scripture like that. The one, the menorah, it really has seven branches. And it's, it's always been that way. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you see, if you stand next to it, you can see it's, it's actually pretty big. And uh, it's under a dome outside that uh, Hurva synagogue. And uh, there's, there's a square there outside that synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, so here in the Torah portions, we see instruction given to Aharon to maintain the lights on the menorah for the purpose of providing light, right? So we see that here in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> Numbers chapter 8. It says, Aharon did so, this is verse 3, set up the lamps to face toward the front of the lampstand as Yahweh commanded Moshe. 
And this is the work of the lampstand, beaten work of gold from its base to its blossoms, its beaten work. According to the pattern which Yahweh had shown Moshe, so he made the lampstand. <clears throat> so we also see uh, here about you know, this trimming of the lamp. So what's causing this light to burn, right? Um, some people think it was candles, some menorahs, you know, that you can buy it, you know, off of eBay or something like that. There'll be candles for, for candles in there. That's really not what the menorah's fuel is. The fuel, as we see in Exodus chapter 27, verses 21 to 22, we could just go over there a minute, um, talks about what, uh, what are these... Uh, what is the lamp burning here? So we see it is uh, pure olive oil, Exodus 27, 20 to 21. Uh, and uh, we read, and you, you are to command the children of Israel. So all of the nation uh, is to bring in clear oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So the idea is that these that light in the tabernacle never goes out. <clears throat> and that's what we're talking about here in, in Numbers chapter 8. Um, as you can see with, with this menorah, we've, we've done this in the past. We have little cups in here with a wick in each one and it's burning. But it only lasts so long, right? It, the wick burns up and wick has to be replaced. And, you know, you have to keep that that burning. Um, it doesn't, you know, burn continually forever. It has to be maintained. So that's uh, something for us to understand. So pure olive oil was the fuel for the light. So let's look at this concept of light in the tabernacle. Uh, from the beginning of the Bible, um, we're going to see the very beginning and the very end and we're going to see light is a constant theme through, through the scriptures. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, it's uh, suffused with the imagery of light. We're going to go to chapter 1 of Genesis. And what's the very first thing that, that Yahweh begins with? In Genesis chapter 1. And we'll start with verse 1. In the beginning, bara bereshit uh, <coughs> Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the earth came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim was moving on the face of the waters. And Elohim said, let light come to be. And light came to be. And Elohim saw the light and that it was good and Elohim separated the light from the darkness. So the very first thing that happens is light separates the darkness. What happens when light appears, right? Darkness flees, you know, it goes away. So the first thing we get from the Bible, other than the idea that there is, an almighty, there is a mighty one and the beginning of creation is light. Yahweh commanded it to shine forth, to banish darkness um, that had hung over the earth since the rebellion of Hasatan. So we don't really, uh, this is the beginning of the physical creation. We saw in other teachings before there was um, some creation that had happened before the uh, physical creation of the earth and the universe. The spiritual realm basically pre-existed the, uh, the physical realm. <clears throat> but here we see at the very beginning of the Bible that light is critical to the creation process, but specifically to a spiritual creation. Yahweh could have done his natural creation, the physical creation, in darkness if he wanted to, obviously, but he did not. He showed a pattern here by opening his physical creation with light, and it's shown from him. So this image of light goes clear through the Bible, and if we go over to Revelation chapter 22, 
we're going to see how light is talked about at the very end we're in chapter 22 here <clears throat> and this is after the new heavens and the new earth so the the timing of this understand you know, Yahshua returns at the end of this age. An another age begins with the millennium or thousand year rule of Yahshua Messiah. So there's a first resurrection that happens uh, at Yahshua's return that includes all of the first fruits, all of the first, uh, the people who have been called and, and uh, either um, have died in Messiah or were... Uh, were, uh, had Yahweh's Holy Spirit at the time Yahshua returned. So they live and reign with Messiah for a thousand years, right? People who were not part of that first fruits are still physical human beings. They're living through into the millennium, right? That thousand year reign. And at the end of that thousand year reign, which we see in uh, chapter 20, um, we saw this great white throne judgment, which happens on uh, chapter 20, verse 11. There's a great white throne on him who was sitting on it and whose face the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And he saw the dead, both small and great, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged or evaluated from what was written in the books according to their works. So what this is describing is a second resurrection. It's a resurrection of everyone else who has ever lived throughout all of human history are going to be resurrected and have their first opportunity to understand or have their minds open to, to Yahweh's truth and be able to um, be evaluated, be able to make a decision you know, same as we are now. We're called, we decide to be chosen, you know, based on our, our uh, response to the calling. And we're faithful through a lifetime, through a period of time where we're evaluated, as we see in Second Peter, um, that judgment begins at the house of Elohim, right? So judgment is now being done with these people that are resurrected in the second resurrection. And when all of that is accomplished, when all of that is finished, um, we see in verse 20, uh, chapter 21, this renewed heaven and renewed earth, right? A new heaven and a new earth. So this is what we talk about on the eighth day assembly, the day after the, uh, the, the, the high day, after we've completed seven days of the, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, right? This, Sukkot. We have a new heavens and a new earth. So everything's brand new, completely different than the physical which we had before. Remember, now everybody is either changed to spirit being or they are completely destroyed, as we see here in in uh, in, uh, in Revelation chapter twenty, just a you know, a couple verses before, death and Sheol were thrown into the lake of fire. This is a second death. It's the eternal death. Those people who refuse to, you know, to respond to this calling, to refuse to, to live Yahweh's way of life are, you know, physically destroyed. You know, they're, they're raised to, to a physical life and they're uh, destroyed in the second death uh, in the lake of fire if you know, they, they just adamantly refuse to, uh, to uh, live Yahweh's way of life, worship Yahweh as the, uh, the creator of all things. Um, and so after this period of evaluation in verse 15, we see anyone not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So everything now, everybody who has uh, ever lived has made a decision, had their minds open, had the opportunity to understand Yahweh's way of life and made a decision. Yes, I want to be part of that, which I think the vast majority of people will do that. But but there will be some that just will not, will will not. They just refuse. And you know, unlike what 
you know, mainstream Christianity and many other things teach, you know, th those people will not spend eternity, everlasting life in hellfire or you know, eternal torment, right? That would, we see here, they're destroyed by fire and, and they uh, will cease to exist completely. So now we get to the point where there's a new heavens and a new earth, right? And uh, <clears throat> at the very end of that, in uh, Revelation 22, the New Jerusalem, right? We see here in uh, we see here in uh, Revelation 22 uh, the conclusion of the creation. The passage is regarding the new heavens and the new earth. So we'll look at uh, verses uh, three to five. So if we look at verse three, it says. No longer shall there be any curse, and the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be upon his their foreheads. And night shall be no more, and they shall have no need of a lamp or the light of the sun, because Yahweh Elohim shall give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So we go from a time where we might call the primordial darkness, right? This time before creation and the throne of Elohim and the lamp uh, shall be in it and his servants shall, I'm sorry, um, I missed them. Uh, uh, Yahweh shines his light upon the earth right away and now we have a beginning in Genesis 1. A commencement of a plan that's going to bring light to everything and everyone as we go through the Bible, the light keeps getting a little stronger, right? Over the course of 4,000 years into it, we have the light of the world come in and shine in the, on the earth. And obviously we know who that is, right? Yahshua uh, described himself as the light of the world. <clears throat> and all men. Uh, then we go into all of history. And after that great event, we have Yahweh with us. He is our light. And he shines brightly, gloriously forever. We don't need any other light than what Yahweh can give us. So now we see the whole plan of Yahweh, the whole plan of salvation in terms of light, that there is a constant generation of light, a constant renewal of light, a constant growth of the light towards a specific goal, which is, which all is light. And that's how important this lamp is. And we turn back to Revelation 21. So we make another point here. <clears throat> that who is the light? What's the source of the light? Revelation 21 verses 22 uh, to 23 says, And I saw no dwelling place in it. This is in the new Jerusalem uh, that has come down from heaven. For Yahweh, El Shaddai, El Almighty, is its dwelling place. And the Lamb, and the city had no need of the sun, nor of the moon, to shine on it. For the esteem of Elohim lightened it, and here, the Lamb is its lamp. So, <clears throat> Remember, we, we remember what Yahshua said in uh, Matthew chapter 5, right? And uh, verses 14 to 15, that his followers were to be lights upon a lampstand on a hill for the world to see. So, right? Remember, he said, this is Matthew chapter 5, right? He said, you are, you are the light of the world, right? You don't hide lamps on... Uh, on a uh, under a bushel, right? You set them on a lampstand. Um, <clears throat> so it's a clear allusion in the mind of anyone in Yahshua's audience to the temple's menorah. You know, he's speaking to you know a Jewish audience. People understand what you know the menorah was all about. And additionally, when a redeemed believer in and a follower of Yahshua is in a sacred state of worshiping his master, we often do this. We, we lift our hands up, right? And we kind of look like a menorah. <clears throat> now, 
Not only is this a universal sign of surrender, in our, this case it's to our Heavenly Father, but when we lift our hands, our bodies are actually forming a human menorah, right? By doing this in worship, we're acting out what we are, a lampstand to the world, a light to the world, radiating forth the good news of the truth and the love of Yahshua. And so, in fact, Scripture shows us that the menorah is really a symbol that we would we would use for I, I sort of identifying believers, not, you know, the cross. That's, you know, that's uh, not a symbol of Yahshua's spiritual body of believers. So we see this in Revelation chapter 1, uh, where this uh, idea of these, uh, the assemblies being represented by lampstands, by menorahs, right? The menorah uh, here is a symbol of a sacred assembly of believers. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we're not going to get into that idea of, of a cross being a, you know, a symbol of believers. It's not, you know, something that we're going to do. But more accurately, we would see um, a menorah uh, here as a symbol of, the, 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 uh, symbol of believers. Um, <clears throat> so let's go over to Isaiah chapter 60. And here at the near the end of the book of Isaiah. We're going to pick this up in verse 19, where it says, uh, <clears throat> this is echoing sort of what we see in Revelation verse 21. He says, uh, No longer is the sun your light by day, nor is the moon give light to you for brightness, but Yahweh shall be to you an everlasting light, and your Elohim your comeliness. No longer does your sun go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For Yahweh shall be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. So uh, here's a, the, the this culmination of this at the end of Revelation. We see uh, Yahweh's glory lights the entire world. There's no temple anymore at the, uh, you know, in, in the New Jerusalem. We just saw there that you know, said there's no dwelling place there. There's no temple. The Lamb is the temple. And Yahweh's glory goes over the entire earth, the whole universe, as far as we know. So there's no need for any lamp or menorah because we have the real menorah, right, is Yahshua Messiah, the Lamb of Elohim as our light source. So Messiah Yahshua himself is a lampstand, and he's the menorah, which... Um, appears earlier in the book of Revelation. We're going to go to chapter 1 of Revelation. We'll see this. <clears throat> it describes uh, uh, Yahshua here in uh, verse, verse 12. We'll start with, well, we'll back up a little bit. This is Yochanan describing what he's seeing in vision, right? And it came to be in the, in the spirit on the day of Yahweh, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last. That's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, last letter, Tav. Uh, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven assemblies of Asia. And it goes on to, to list them. And I turned to give the voice, to see the voice which uh, spoke to me. Having turned, I saw seven golden menorahs or lampstands, right? That word in Greek here is luchnia. It's the same word that's used in the Septuagint as uh, describing uh, a menorah. The same word, H4501. Uh, 
is the same word used in the Septuagint. So we know this is what they're talking about, a seven-branch menorah. It's not, you know, as some would say, it's not just a one-stick candlestick, you know. It's um, some people have, have uh, you know, sort of hypothesized that these seven uh, churches only were one lampstand, right, or one candlestick, and that Yahshua was, you know, in the middle of that. But that kind of doesn't make sense because, you know, um, if Yahshua is the main uh, branch, you'd only have six other ones, not seven. So, but we, we clearly see it's the same word that's used. In Greek, that's the word that's used here, lampstand, is G3087, Luchnia. And uh, in Hebrew, if we see that same word used in, in, uh, in these passages where the word menorah is, is translated or lampstand, it's uh, 4501. So let's get back to this. So um, verse 13, uh, we see <clears throat> seven golden lampstands. And in the midst, in the middle, surrounding or in the middle of these seven lampstands is one like the son of Adam. It's Yahshua, right? Dressed in a robe, down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. <clears throat> so what do these, what do these things r represent? Verse, we drop down to verse 16 here. It says, um, And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shine, the sun shining at his strength. You know, again, a source of light. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. <clears throat> So it doesn't exactly so it doesn't exactly mention light per se, but what does the sun do? It gives forth light. So its face is providing all of the illumination. So what we have here, if you will, is the New Testament version of the menorah, right? It's the seen in the Old Testament version in the tabernacle. So as we we saw in Numbers chapter eight at the beginning of our Torah portion, right? very specifically said in here, you're to make this according to the pattern that Moshe was shown on the mountain. He was shown what this looks like in heaven, right? And he said, make this look like that, right? So this already exists in, in heaven. And it's clear then that the seven lampstands have him as their common link, these seven lampstands. Um, He's the one who shines upon them. He's the one they are congregating around. He's their focus, and he is, and they are his focus. It's the imagery of the olive trees and the other one in, in, uh, in Zechariah 4. Remember, if you go to, we're not going to turn to Zechariah 4 right now, but um, again, the, the two lampstands are, serve as witnesses to the whole world, right? And there's oil coming in and from olive trees, feeding these two menorahs. <clears throat> so in this figure, Yahshua Messiah is the one supplying these seven menorahs with their needs. He's central to them in all they do, that all that they say, all that they are. He is their central figure and they're arrayed around him. And that's very important. What it's showing us here is a unique image of Yahshua's place and work among the assemblies of Yahweh. Because it tells us in verse 20 what they are, right? Uh, verse 20, the secret of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are messengers or angelic, you know, uh, beings, messengers, angels of the seven assemblies. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are seven assemblies <clears throat> and to each one of these he gives some instructions to the angels or to the messengers of these seven assemblies he gives them instructions and teachings and some correction and some praise and some uh, encouragement 
<clears throat> so th this this uh, this new picture shows matters as they really are. Messiah in heaven, he is shining his countenance upon them. He's supplying them spiritually with what they need. His countenance is shining on all of them. He's in control, he's directing, he's guiding, he's supplying their needs. They are receiving his light. But their ability to receive it or their willingness to receive it is a different matter. And we see that as we go through chapter 2 and chapter 3, where these, this instruction and encouragement and admonitions of each of the assemblies is, uh, is given. So let's, let's go to chapter 1 of, of John and see this a little bit have a little bit more clarity here. Yochanan, chapter 1. <clears throat> so we're going to read through verse 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim, and he came to be through him, and without him not even one came to be that came to be. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There it is again. Yahshua is the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from Elohim, whose name was Yochanan. This one came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light. Yochanan was not the light, but that he might bear witness of that light. Who's the light? Yahshua. He was the true light. Yahshua was the true light which enlightens every man coming into the world. Drop down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent or dwelt among us. And we saw his esteem uh, as of an only brought forth uh, of a father, complete in favor and in truth. Here, Yahshua is called several things having to do with light. He's called the light of men, the true light, the light. And we get the impression that he is a divine being, okay, which very clearly describes him as a divine being, which we are supposed to get, which is resplendent in glory, and became resplendent in glory when he returned to his father. Then verse 14 adds to the fact that he, this, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, for full of grace and truth, which is tacked on like you know, in a positive of what the, the glory is. These images, light, life, light of the world, full of grace and truth, glory, all tie together, right? First John tells us in verse 4 that Messiah has life inherent within him and that he was life. In him was life and he was with Yahweh. <clears throat> Only Yahweh has inherent, inherent life. He always existed and always will exist. And when you have life inherent with you, within you, you'll also have the ability to give life. And we see that when we went back to Genesis 1, right? He was that life that gave mankind life. He also was the life that is uh, giving us spiritual life. That is where the light of men comes in. So this eternal life, that is Messiah Yahshua, is the light of men. That is, he's the revelator of truth and the guide along the way to eternal life. And you see how much that means to us. He's not only reveals the way, the truth, but he's also the life that gives us eternal life. Um, so we see that in John 15, John chapter 15 and verse five, right? And what does he say there? Uh, <clears throat> where he's describing himself here as a vine, right, with the branches connected to it. Same as the menorah here with the branches connected to the center stem. We see in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who stays in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Because without me, you are able to do nothing. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Aleph and the Tav. Uh, and it's just, you know, incredible to think about how much we truly depend on him. 
He starts everything and will end everything uh, for us along the way. He's given us gifts constantly helping us along the way to get us where he wants us to go. And that is why he is the light of men. Because without that light he gives us, we would have no hope. We could not get off square one. So we need Messiah Yahshua as the light of men to give us everything we need. <clears throat> everything we need along the way. The part that we play in this is really very minuscule. It's very small. We do have free moral agency, of course. We do have to cooperate in this. We do have to submit to his will. But really, all of the work is not done by us, right? It's done by Yahshua. It's done by Yahweh, right? <clears throat> in John, just another page over, in 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is just another way of saying he does everything. He is everything to us. So he's the key to eternal life. And if, you know, we want to receive eternal life, then we must turn to him and listen to him and do what he says, take his directions, follow his lead, tread on his paths. And, uh, <clears throat> and however more ways that, that it can be put to you, this is the only way to eternal life through him. <clears throat> So as we talked about Yahshua, you know, describing uh, us as lights, and we go back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, where it says, You are the light of the world. It's impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand so it shines uh, to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men so they see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. <clears throat> Yahshua also said this about himself in John chapter 8, right? He says, therefore, Yahshua spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. So Matthew chapter 5, right? He's talking to crowds of people who says, you are the light of the world, right? John chapter 8, verse, 11, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world, speaking about himself. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. <clears throat> so, this is a pretty amazing thing that he's really doing here. Is he's, um, he's the light of the world, and we're the light of the world. We should feel about, you know, sort of this big, quite small. It should also give us a great deal of hope because he considers us to be the light of the world just like him, right? Not by any means to his magnitude, but he calls us the light of the world, collectively the light of the world. <clears throat> we are just a, a, a mere reflections of the true light that is Messiah Yahshua. He's the original, uh, he's the original, originator of what little feeble light we cast. Like that olive oil, you know, that is children of Israel to were just supplied to the menorah, to the temple. Um, his light is pure and it's undefiled. It's pure, clean, clear olive oil. His light is sinless and holy. It's perfectly righteous and constant. Our light is sort of smoky, dim, and feeble. Our oil needs changing, right? There's no comparison between our light and his light. But we're reaching for his light. He is our example. The one we look to as the pattern for all that is good and true and right in the light that we, could do, uh, that we do cast. So the last thing that John does here is he informs us that Ma Messiah Yahshua radiates glory. The glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. And this glory is manifested as the fullness of grace and truth. That is specifically how it was manifested while he was here. 
but also how he manifests it even today. The glory of the only begotten Son of the Father is manifested in the fullness of grace and truth. <clears throat> in a way, we could say that these two things, grace and truth, are primary elements of the symbol of light in the Bible. That is, if we were going to say, talk about the symbol of light, every one of them could be drawn back to these two elements, grace and truth. You know that we understand the part about truth pretty well, and I think we could get to that part too, as we recognize, as Peter said in, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, as John said in John 6, uh, 68, um, where he says, uh, let's just go to John 6, 68. I'm sorry, this is about Peter speaking. Yahshua asked him um, if he would go away too after, you know, he gave some pretty difficult instructions to people. And what did Yahshua, uh, what did Peter say? Simon Computer said, Shimon Kepha answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You possess the words of everlasting life. <clears throat> And so to put it another way, you're the one who has the truth that leads us to eternal life. We get that part. That's easy to understand. But we know that his teachings are the bedrock on which the rest of the word of Yahweh is founded. And although these things that tells us to do, uh, tells us to do may be hard to understand sometimes and particularly hard to apply in our lives, we acknowledge that he is the final authority of the true uh true knowledge and understanding. If we ever have a question about something Shaul has written or something that John has written or something that Moshe has written, we find the words of Messiah on the matter. And that's what we stand on. We stand on scripture, you know, not our own imagination or our own understanding. He told Yahweh the Father, your word is truth. Right? This is 17 chapters later. And, uh, in his final prayer before his arrest. Uh, John had said that Messiah Yahshua was the word of Yahweh. So Messiah Yahshua is truth. So this equation of the symbol of light with truth and Yahweh's word and law is found frequently. We can see this in, a, in, a, in several places in the Psalms, right? I'm, we're not gonna turn there, but I'll just throw these out for you. Psalm 19, verse 8. The orders or the, the instructions of Yahweh are straight or righteous, rejoicing the heart. The command of Yahweh is clear, enlightening the eyes. <clears throat> Yahweh's commandments give us light. Psalm 43, 30, 43, 3. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your set-apart mountain and to your dwelling place. Again, Yahweh's word is truth. Yahweh's word is light. All of that radiates from is, is, uh, uh, what we see symbolized in the menorah in the tabernacle or in the, the temple. Here he says that your light and your truth is what leads us to Yahweh's tabernacle. They're what leads us in worship. They're the ones that lead us then to dwelling with Yahweh in his kingdom. Psalm 119, 105. We, songs about this, right? Everybody knows this. this is a great thing that everybody says. Um, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Yahweh's word is symbolized there in that menorah shedding light and giving us the path or lighting the path to walk on. So if we have any darkness or confusion on the way to go or how to walk in this life, we go to Yahweh's word for the answer and it will light our way and show us the path we do not, so we don't stumble. Still in Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. 
So when Yahweh's words enter into us, we begin to understand and we are enlightened. We have light for our way and we soon have an understanding. And we get this equation of light and truth. The idea of light and grace, though, is a little bit less understood because the idea of grace, you know, has we've got this false concept of, you know, Jesus loves you, everything's fine, right? You have grace and that no matter what you do, if you believe, you're saved, right? That's a false doctrine and it's not true. Um, <clears throat> so many think of grace as merely a, a gift of Yahweh's redemption, eternal life. It is that, and it's used that way quite often, that the grace of Yahweh came and sort of yanked us out of the terrible way that we were living and put us on the right path. And these are certainly uh, true gifts of his grace. So it is grace when he gives us pardon or gives us faith and gives us hope. It is grace when he gives us favor in men's eyes for a job or whatever that might be. These are all graces of Yahweh. But if we want to put it in its fullest understanding in terms of how it's used in John 1, and we have to broaden this even further. The grace in this context in chapter 1 of John manifested in Messiah Yahshua. In his absolute goodness, going beyond his gifts, giving us justification and eternal life. But it also encompasses, encapsulates all of his goodness. Another way you can put this to say is that his grace is holy, righteous character. It is how he is. He cannot act any other way because he is righteousness. You know, Yahshua's name is going to be changed, right? Right now it's Yahshua, right? Yahweh is salvation is what that means. In the future, right, we see this in, in Revelation. I can get you just off the top of my head. It's going to be uh, Yahweh, our righteousness will be his name. Yahweh Zekenu. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a manifestation of his goodness towards us. But it's not something that just we can just count on and just be, um, you know, say, oh, well, we'll just do whatever we want, right? You know, Yahshua himself says, why do you call me master, master, and not do the things which I say? You know, you can say all you want, Jesus loves me, everything's fine, but it's really not fine if your life isn't looking like what Yahweh, um, Yahweh pointed out for us. So we can think of this in physical terms or spiritual terms, but obviously the psalmist is thinking about spiritual terms. This is in Psalm 33, chapter uh, 33, 4 through 5. <clears throat> so we see this... Uh, says, for the word of Yahweh is straight. All his works are in truth. Loving righteousness and right ruling or righteousness and justice. The earth is filled with the mercy or loving commitment of Yahweh. <clears throat> Everything that Yahweh does is good. It's an aspect then of his grace. Even his justice, when he does something that we do not, uh, he does something that we do not what to think, know what to think of, it's still part of his grace. It is how he is. He has to uphold the way that he is. It's his perfect, righteous character that he's manifesting to us. Uh, and the one to show us this most fully is Messiah Yahshua. He came to earth and, and during his ministry demonstrated Yah this, this walk. This is what it looks like. My life, this is what I'm showing you. This is how to do it. <clears throat> his truth is good for sure. But this example of his perfect life in Messiah Yahshua is found in his perfect character, his perfect attitude, his perfect speech, his perfect interpersonal relations with others, and on and on. His light is still shining through the example that he gave to us. So his goodness did not did not shine just when he spoke, but also in every word, every action, every expression on his face, every thought, you name it, it was an expression of Yahweh's goodness of his light. And this is where this idea of a witness comes through because he did what was a witness 
for the Almighty Yahweh and Father of how Yahweh acts. He showed us Yahweh's grace. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Uh, and we'll pick this up in verse ten. And he says, This is Shaul writing. He um, says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and increase the seed you have sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness being enriched in every way for all simplicity in which works out the thanksgiving to Elohim through us. Because the rendering of this service not only supplies the needs of the set-apart ones, the saints, the, us, but also the overflowing through many thanksgiving to Elohim. So what he is saying here is the gift that they have given to us, uh, had given was, was going to do a great work more than just giving them food, but also was going to witness for Yahweh to the assembly, uh, going to be a witness for, uh, for uh, Yahweh to the assembly of Yahweh. And he's writing this in response to, you know, him um, asking for help with people, with a famine that's going on in Judea. Right? <clears throat> So drop, uh, continue on in verse 13. Through the proof of this service, they esteem Elohim on the submission of your confession to the good news of Messiah and generosity in sharing with them all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you to be a, uh, because of the succeeding favor or grace of Elohim in you. Thanks also to Elohim for his unspeakable gifts. So this again is a sort of a, a physical um, demonstration of this idea of light, of being lights to the world. It's an example of, you know, uh, what this looks like in real life. You know, it's serving other people, serving, uh, serving the brethren, serving that, uh, um, you know, those around us. So what they had done here by doing the service for the Judean brethren was showing the grace of Yahweh in them, that they were manifesting the grace of Yahweh in their own lives. It's just like I said, it's a, you know, it's a demonstration of what this looks like in our walk. Here's a, a small example of what this uh, idea of grace and truth equating to light, being lights to the world. So the same witness we're going to, uh, that we are going to give all the time, the same light that we are to shine upon the world, this is what Messiah Yahshua said in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world, right? Don't hide it under a bushel basket, right? <clears throat> give light to the whole house. The, our witness, too, has to be one of grace and truth. And we're following the example of the light of the world, not just a light of the world, but the light of the world, Messiah Yahshua. <clears throat> we'll finish with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just a couple of, of uh, pages back, chapter 4 and verse 6. Shaul writes, For Elohim who said, Let sh light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts uh, for the enlightening of the knowledge of the esteem of Elohim in the face of Yahshua Messiah. <clears throat> the same Elohim who commanded, let there be light, also commanded light to shine toward us in the personal and uh, the person and example of Messiah Yahshua to give us knowledge and the example we need to become his children, to glow and radiate with the same light he had. Because Messiah Yahshua, the true light of the world, we can approach the Father in grace and truth and laid hold upon the promise of eternal life in his kingdom. So, I hope this has been a blessing to you. 
we'll go ahead and uh, end the teaching right there and say hallelujah.